You're listening to The Roundup Podcast, a podcast on reaching the college campus, developing leaders, and sending out kingdom multipliers. This podcast is created by the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention and provided through cooperative program giving. Well, howdy, friends, and welcome to The Roundup Podcast. I am your host, Mitch Tidwell. Thank you for joining us today. Pretty excited about today's episode with Drew Dabbs. Drew is the minister to college at Morrison Heights Baptist Church in Clinton, Mississippi. Drew and I got to meet a couple years ago in a uh, what's called a leader kind of learning community we did with Scott Kendig, and he was kind of helping us think through how to make disciples of college students who then can in turn reached the campus. And and that was like a couple of years ago. Well, talking to Drew recently, he's seen his ministry go from a leadership huddle of 12 college students to now 30, I think, eight huddles of these um, leadership huddles. And so he's like rapidly making disciples. So I was like, man, we got to get you on to talk about that, how you're doing that. But then also we talk about missional community and how these kind of communities of students are being used to reach the college students on the three campuses uh, they minister to. So It's a super fascinating podcast. Grab a journal, grab a pen, open notes up on your computer, because I think there's a lot of good nuggets here for you to take away in terms of methods to making disciples and then also reaching those on your campus. So super excited for this. Before we jump in, I want to share with you, we are just a few weeks away from Roundup. It'll be May 12th through the 14th. This is a collaborative learning environment for what we call as church-based collegiate Multiplier. So if you are leading a college ministry as a college pastor or a pastor, or if you're a student leader in your college ministry, this event is for you and it's completely free. It's in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. We have a great lineup JD Greer, we have Daniel Yang, we have Dusty Thompson, and we have just 20 something other breakout speakers with all kinds of topics. You can find out more information on sbtexas.com forward slash roundup. It's going to be a great event. It's free. All you need to do is get there. I will say that you only have a couple of days left to register because registration ends May 1st. So make sure you get registered. And the best way to come is bring a team. So don't come alone. If, if you have to come alone, that's totally okay. But try to bring your ministry team with you because what we found is that if you learn together as a group, then you don't have to go back to your church to cast vision for what you learned. You can capture it there. We're going to create time and space for you to learn, but also for you to collaborate with other churches and collaborate with your church to determine what are your next steps going into fall 2021. So it'll be a great time. Don't forget to register sbtexas.com forward slash roundup. Now... Let's get to our interview with Drew Dabbs. Drew, how's it going, man? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. We're uh, way past Snowvid, which was the crazy <laughs> ice storm here in February. We've got through spring break, and now this will actually be dropping in April. So temperatures are warming up. So we're we're doing pretty good here, man. Man, glad to have you on. Thanks for taking the time to be on. Hey, absolutely. I love the the work y'all are doing, Southern Baptist of Texas Convention over there, and uh, excited to get to be a part of it. Yeah, dude. Well, I'm really impressed you got the name right, Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. Nobody ever gets that right. But SBTC, good job. it's super easy. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's usually Southern Baptist Convention of Texas is how people word it, which is how I did for like oh. the first year I worked here. But anyways, well, man, glad to have you on. Just to, to our listeners, uh, Drew and I got kind of got to know each other. A couple of years ago, we were involved in uh, what we call like a huddle with Scott Kendig and a bunch of other college ministers, mm-hmm. just learning how to develop leaders in ministry and do missional community, how to try to get students to think less inwardly and kind of more out, outward focus uh, to see their campus and the, and the people that they're around as a mission field, rather than as church as this kind of consumeristic kind of thing that they attend. And, and I know, Drew, that when we were in there, man, you were... I don't know if I'd call her, I guess we were students, but I feel like you were one of the best students <laughs> in that room. Huh. And I know that you have done like a, a big transition in your ministry in developing these leader communities of leadership huddles and then missional communities in your church. And I want us to get to that here in just a second. But before we jump into that, I'd love for people to have some context uh, about you and kind of who you are, where you're from, a little bit about your family, and then tell us about the church in which you minister. 
Yeah. So I'm Mississippi born and raised. Mm -hmm. My plan was to graduate college and leave Mississippi. And I'm still here in the <laughs> town I went, went to college in, which is awesome. Um, now, I'm, I'm a Mississippi college grad. Mississippi College is in Clinton, Mississippi, which is just west of Jackson. Mm -hmm. So I moved here as a freshman in 2004, and the Lord kept me here. And um, I became a part of Morrison Heights Baptist Church, which is a large church here in Clinton, in 2005, which I think you had uh, Dr. Charles Smith here on here recently. We did. He, uh, yeah, he was the worship leader at the college ministry, and I was his bass player. Uh, so that's how I became a part of the college ministry. Um, Dude, I just picture you with a mullet and just <laughs> tickling those that that bass man with those fingers. That's what I picture Dude, Drew Dabbs. <laughs> it was actually you were not that far off, man. My, I had a lot more hair back then. It was a lot longer. Uh, I love never. It. Well, actually, it probably was mulletish at some point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Which, but, by the yeah, way, is we, it, I feel like that's making a comeback among college students. Are you seeing that at all where you're at Mississippi? Man, I got this this kid that recently permed his mullet. <laughs> oh, so it is a thing. I love he, it. <laughs> he looks pretty awesome, though. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to do it, but yeah. man, I'm, I'm behind him all yeah, the way. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we've got, I've been married for the last six years. My wife's name is Christy. We got a, two boys, four and one, Isaac and Nathan. Mm. So I've been in ministry since 2011 serving here at the church and in the college ministry before that. I'm the college minister at Morrison Heights now. We work on three college campuses. We got Mississippi College, 5,000 students, small, private, Southern Baptist, 15 minutes one way. We got a large community college campus that has about 1,500 students on campus. Mm -hmm. And then 15 minutes the other direction, we got a HBU, Jackson State University, which they're about 7,000 enrollment there. Gotcha. And so we do ministry on all three campuses. Man, that's great, dude. Well, cool. Well, tell us a little bit about, you know, Morrison Heights. And I, I know that when we were in that that call with Scott that all of us were going through there for about a year, I know there was some transitions that you were making in your ministry. So tell us a little bit kind of about when you got into your college ministry, what did that look like? And then as you began to learn some of those things about leadership huddles, missional community, how did you begin to make that transition? And then, and then really like behind that, like why did you decide to make that transition and kind of establish your ministry the way it is? Yeah. So the before for us, before Leadership Huddles and Missional Community, we had student-led Bible studies. And there were a couple of things that were always kind of core to the DNA. We always wanted them to be missional in the sense that we always saw it as we're developing student leaders and sending them back to campus yeah. to lead Bible studies that even lost people could come to but we kind of hit a point, two things happened about three years ago. Uh, we had a group come in named Life Action Ministries. They've been really critical in my walk. And we had a group of freshmen that the Lord started doing some really cool stuff in their lives. Mm -hmm. And out of that, I recognized that we needed a place in our ministry where college students could practice confession and repentance, yeah. um, where they could name their sins and and actually hold one another accountable. And hmm. I, I recognize that our Bible studies weren't doing that. Mm -hmm. I had a leader who we were just talking about how our, we were evaluating our um, Bible studies. And he said, you know, I feel like if I were to call out one of the guys in my Bible study on their sin, that would just be weird. Hmm. And I was, I heard that and I'm like, okay, well, if it's not happening in our small groups, then where is it happening? How are students going to hear what the Lord's saying and respond in obedience. Mm. How are they going to experience freedom from sin? Yeah. And so I started looking around and try to figure out, are there any churches that have that place? And also we, we looked at our Bible studies and saw that they weren't on the one hand discipling students well, but on the other hand, they weren't really that missional either mm -hmm. because most lost people aren't that interested in a Bible study. Mm -hmm. So we were sending our students out and we were releasing them well, but they didn't really have the tools they needed to disciple well or do mission well. And while we were searching, I found a couple of churches that had some things happening that I really liked. And those churches were using this leadership development tool that they called Huddle mm -hmm. while they were doing missional communities. And so I, I, I just started finding people 
who could help me learn how to do that. And uh, that's how I ended up in this group with all these Texas guys <laughs> yeah, who, yeah, you did. Yeah. who welcomed me in, which I was really glad because mm-hmm. Texas is so much bigger than Mississippi. Oh, that I appreciated y'all. You seem like one of the <laughs> said guys. Bigger, <laughs> said bigger, not necessarily better. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I ended up in that group. Okay. Well, how, like, so tell me a little bit about, you know, we've been using this terminology, leadership huddle, missional community. Can you de- de- kind of define those for me and what are the differences between those? Yeah, leadership huddle for us, it's groups of anywhere from three to six students who are believers that meet weekly. And that's that for us is a really high commitment. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're telling them you're there every week, pretty much no matter what. And if you miss a couple of weeks, the, the leader is going to sit down and have a conversation with that student. That, hey, are you are you bought in? Is this what you want? Or do you need to take some time where yeah. you can commit to this later? Mm-hmm. Uh, and during that time, this is not a Bible study. Yeah it's a time where they sit across the table and look at one another and say, what's the Lord saying to you and what are you going to do about it? Mm. It's repent. What's God saying to you and believe what are you going to do about it this week? So we want them to, as a disciple, learn to hear the voice of the Lord for themselves. Mm. We have some tools we use called life shapes that, that we use, but all of the life shapes are really just born out of that idea of the Lord is speaking to us in our lives all the time. And we always need to be, when he speaks, we need to obey. Mm-hmm. So that's huddle for us. Yeah. Okay. And, and so those are, and then you have huddle and then missional community. What's, what's kind of the difference that you see in, in those two things? The main difference is huddle for us is, is given solely for believers, but missional community would be where we welcome those who don't gotcha follow Christ in. Gotcha. We say missional community, the, the line we use is their families on mission. Mm-hmm. So they're families of anywhere from eight to 20 believers that are gathering regularly as, as the body of Christ, but then they're pursuing lostness, engaging lostness regularly. They have a regular rhythm of engaging lostness. So for us, we spent a year just doing huddle, mm-hmm. just discipling leaders to prepare them for mission, for missional Mm -hmm. community. Now those tend to work side by side, but through the transition, the very first thing we did was disciple leaders because we didn't have enough leaders to run missional community. Mm -hmm. We had to disciple people into understanding the mission that God's called them to. Mm -hmm. But now we've got, I think it's 11 missional communities um, that we've developed and led over the last two years that are doing ministry on campus. So for us, missional communities are all fully student led. We have a lot of leadership development happening within that, but the key difference is anyone can be a part of a missional community, Mm -hmm. but huddle is very invitational. It's only for believers. So if I'm kind of getting this right, it was kind of like you assessed your ministry. You thought, hey, this is not a bad thing, but I think this could be better as far as confession of sin, but also this Mm -hmm. missional component to this ministry. And so what you started with was gathering just a leadership huddle, and you began to invest in a few that eventually multiplied themselves into other huddles, but also these missional communities. Is that that right? Am I tracking there? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so tell um, tell me about the, that first huddle. Like, what do you when you say, "Hey, I need to," because and I, I think this is what what the case is with a lot of ministries. Drew is that they're like, "I just don't have the leaders. I don't have the capability." But it sounds like you just kind of started from this you kind of little nucleus of of students, and it just kind of grew from there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the things that Scott always told us told me was that if your vision outpaces your leaders, you need to slow down and make more leaders. Mm. And that's a statement I have had to return to over and over again for the last three years. So when we started that first leadership huddle, I had 12 leaders who were primed and ready to be huddled. They had been a part of my leadership team, most of them for two years already. So Mm. I'd already walked alongside of them for two years. I'd 
I didn't necessarily know what I was doing, but I was investing in them. I already had the relational component of a huddle that has Mm -hmm. to be there as you're inviting people into your life. And so for that group, all I had to do was give them the challenge. Hey, we're going to do this for you. You're going to learn how to do it. And I want you to go ahead and start doing it with others. Mm -hmm. But if I did not have those 12, my first task would be, okay, I just need three or four or five who will say yes to being huddled yeah. for a year um, where I could walk alongside of them to get to the point where I could look at them and say, okay, Hey, we're going to continue doing huddle, but I want you to now grab three or four or five mm-hmm. guys or girls. So yeah, that first year it was me, my wife, and another, um, another female leader in our ministry. We just huddled those first 12 a- as they started leading their own huddles. Okay. Uh, and it's it's multiplied outward from there to where we have, I think, 38 huddles right now wow. happening in two and a half years now of doing it. Wow, man. So you got, so y'all three led that huddle and, and simultaneously they were, so essentially those students were part of two huddles. They were for, with you guys and then also they were actually went on to lead their own huddles and they're just kind of, kind of what they're learning in y'all's they're, they're sharing in this other one. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. And I don't know that that would work in most situations. It was, it was just really clear at that time to me that the Lord had arranged it so that our leaders were ready to do that. Gotcha. Gotcha. I think we kind of got to accelerate the process a little more than a lot of people who may make this transition would. Hey, you mentioned something just a second ago. You said, what was the quote you got from Scott? If your vision outpaces your leaders, you need to slow down. Is that what you said? Yeah, slow down and make more leaders. Mm, man, that's good. Now, why did that quote resonate so much to you? <laughs> Being a minister, I always think everything's going to go faster than it actually does. You know, I, <laughs> yeah, I, tend so to, true. I tend to believe that like what makes stuff happen is my ability to like strategize and create a one four one four and like set all the goals for how much X by Y and all these things and you know, I, I did all of that and the, the Lord still gave, but it was never as much as I imagined. Mm-hmm. And I always had to remind myself, though, the, the, my first task as a minister, that statement reminded me that my first task is to make leaders. And if I trust that process, I don't know, I, I guess it's like a snowball rolling down a hill. It's, it's just going to keep on taking more and more snow until it's the huge avalanche at the bottom. And that's the kind of kingdom growth. I want to see. Mm. And that's not something I can force or make happen. So if I were feeling frustrated that my vision, that I couldn't enact it, then I I would remember that statement and step back and say, okay, how can I make more leaders so that the vision that I think the Lord's given me can actually happen? Dude, that is a stinking word, man. <laughs> that is really good. You could write a book on that and sell a bunch. <laughs> well, uh, maybe Scott's got the rights to that. I don't yeah, know. Scott, I'm going to let Scott have that since I quoted him on it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Man, that is such a really good word. And I've, I guess because I've seen probably even in myself and then even in other ministries, there's just that frustration of feeling like there's something the Lord wants to do, but don't have the bodies to do it. And part of that is is realizing that part of your vision may be to, hey, to develop the leaders that are going to fulfill what the Lord is doing kind of in your midst. So, man, it's such a good word. Well, well tell us a little bit about, let's, let's kind of zoom in just a little bit more on kind of the nuts and bolts of a leadership huddle. You talked about the big picture is to help them kind of know and obey. So listen to the Lord and obey the Lord. And you mentioned like a life shape. So what what are kind of these core, sounds like the, the major core competency there is that you want to help people, people, you know, listen and obey the Lord. Is there anything else going on there that you're trying to kind of ingrain in the students? Because that seems to be like your major leader development, disciple making kind of method is that leadership huddle, right? Yeah. And it's through huddle where we identify people who are ready to become leaders. Gotcha. So we're, we're developing them as leaders, Mm -hmm. man. One thing I recognize is before we were doing leadership huddle, I was pretty much dependent on college students showing up and being ready to lead Mm -hmm. before they got here because I didn't have a mechanism to help them grow as leaders. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, 
there's just not that many college students who show up as an 18 year old guy or girl ready to leave. <laughs> yeah. And so what I've seen is that huddle has given us the mechanism to both develop and identify people mm. who are ready to lead. And, and, and I think it's just helped us really expand and multiply some of the things we, that are first priority to get into students. One is hearing the voice of the Lord, responding in obedience. A second one is to help them evaluate their relationships. How's your relationship with the Lord? How's your relationships with other believers? And how's your relationships with the lost? Mm -hmm. And that's the key component to help them start thinking about mission. And then another big one for college students is thinking about rhythms of work and rest and how to do that well. Because unless until you get that right, it's really hard to do mission. <laughs> yeah. Until you've learned how to just manage your life in general, it's hard to give up your life. You've got to have the margin to, to go and do and pursue the lost and mm -hmm. be in, in community with the body of Christ. So those are some of the big things. Life shapes are, it's just a picture to help you process God's truth, mm -hmm. uh, to help you process the truth of scripture. And it's an evaluative tool for us. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a curriculum we're trying to force students through, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, you know, it's, based out of 3DM, Mike Breen's book, Building a Discipling Culture, yep. the ideas that he has. And we've, we've found that those ideas consistently come up in our discipleship with college students. Mm -hmm. And so if, if one of our huddle leaders hears like, man, my, my students are just exhausted, mm -hmm. then I would say like, hey, you need to walk them through work rest, what we call the semicircle. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a tool that they have, and it's really helpful, and it's really reproducible. And that was a big thing. A lot of the discipleship stuff I tried in the past, like I could teach it, but then like my 19 year old sophomore would just feel kind of overwhelmed and not know what to do. But when it comes to life shapes, it's it's really easy, really practical. And any of our student leaders can take it and reproduce it in the lives of others. Man, Man that's a good word, oh, especially that, you know, the, the whole work rest. I mean, I see that at the local ministry that I'm, I'm at at my, at my church and there's a, you know, I feel like I see students that they're they're kind of at the far edges of those pendulums oftentimes where it's like it's work, 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 work for the kingdom, and then they kind of burn themselves out. And so it just kind of slams to the other side where it's like rest, they don't want to do anything, and they just need a lot of care because it's their Christian walk has become more about working for God rather than being with God, and it kind of that pendulum kind of swings pretty heavy. And then yeah. you got somewhere you just got to kind of kind of push them out into the field of like, Hey, you know, you're sent, but well, that's really good, man. And, uh, so that's kind of, so that's kind of your main hub where you're one, you're discipling folks, but you're, you're, you're training up leaders in your college ministry to disciple there. And I think it's kind of cool. One of the things that, you know, personally, I use the, the life shapes too. And I know that it's really helps you be, you know, if you can get to a place of being really int intuitive on how you're using some of those tools based on, where the people are at in your ministry are currently, just as you said, if everyone feels exhausted, well, it's probably time to, hey, let's talk about work and rest a little bit yep. in this. So, yeah, that's good. I had something, what was I, I was just thinking of something else I wanted to ask about that. I'll come back to it here in a minute if I can't think of it. Okay, well, cool. All right, so now how, so now you've got leaders in these huddles, and then now they're going out to lead missional community. Now, missional communities is a much different kind of thing than a huddle. So how are you kind of... Yeah preparing to launch those or how do you know who's doing that and how does that kind of happen? Yeah, it was a funny transition, transitioning away from Bible studies to missional community. Uh -huh. We had to help our student leaders understand, Hey, you're, you're no longer just leading a Bible study, although you will do some Bible study as a part of missional community. Yeah. For us, missional community has a rhythm. They spend, our leaders spend two weeks focused on, we call them up and in. So relationship with the father and relationship with one another as believers. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of family time is the body of Christ. And then on the third week, they have what we call an out night. So they'll, they'll throw some kind of party or a hangout time that's specifically focused in on inviting people that they wish knew Jesus better. Mm -hmm. So it's the kind of party that lost people would want to come to. Gotcha. And we say those parties are 95% fun, 5% Jesus, because you got lost people and saved people in the same space. Yep. And then on the fourth week, I tell them, you can do whatever you want. You can have a planning night. Y'all can just go get dinner together, whatever you want to do. So there's a really natural rhythm built in. And we're just asking students to, to give this time every week. 
our students pretty much totally plan out their missional communities. Like I give some guardrails, but as far as where they want to tackle, like what area of lostness on campus they want to tackle and how they want to tackle it, I, I give them freedom. And then my staff and I just kind of step in and coach them on it. We do leader learning communities twice a year at the beginning of each semester where we put all of our missional community leadership into a room and we work them through some tools so that really they do all their own evaluation of the previous semester and then they develop their plan for the next semester. When we first started doing that, I was kind of nervous because I'm like, what if they, like, what if they mess it up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> And after that first semester, I realized that, like, honestly, them messing it up is one of the, the best things they could do, because at the next LLC, they dug in and they figured it out themselves. Mm. And so they, by sometimes even failing, they have learned how to become missionaries in their current context even better than, like, I could have if I just told them how to do it. So we've, we, have a, we have a process that, that just gives them guardrails and sets them free to learn how to run on their own. And um, that's, that's been honestly one of my favorite parts of the process. Okay. We invite anyone who wants to help lead to LLC. I'm telling, I've got a few leaders in each group, but I say, hey, whoever you want to bring to a leader learning community, bring them in. And we've seen more energy and excitement come from that time than anything else we do as a ministry. Hmm. All right, so you got so going back for just a second, you got missional community roughly two nights of a month. It's time with the father, time with each other. That third night is just kind of an out party, yep. something to invite lost people to, and that fourth night's kind of up to their choosing. And you're yep. evaluating all of this through these leader learning communities that you're doing at the beginning of fall and beginning of spring. Is that correct? That's it. Okay, so for that fall, you're that leader learning community. That's pl- basically kind of shaping that fall. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And you yeah. said you would look back to the spring mm-hmm. uh, and evaluate, and then you would look forward to the fall. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. That's, that's and really you know, cool. We, <laughs> my staff, we set a goal. We want last spring, we wanted to see our missional communities multiply. Mm-hmm. And so we were trying to do all this stuff to get them to multiply. And of course, COVID dropped in the middle of the spring. And our groups did not multiply at all in the fall. We had eight groups last spring, we had eight groups again this fall. And so we didn't do anything with it last fall. And at our spring LLC, our students, by their own volition, got the vision for multiplication, and they just multiplied. And Mm -hmm. so we went from 8 to 11 missional communities just at LLC. And my staff didn't do a thing (laughs) Mm -hmm. to see it grow. And it it was pretty powerful to be in that room and see that, something that I had wanted and I thought would go faster, like, just kind of happened on its own because the DNA was there and And they got it initially. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. Wow, dude. So let's, let's dive into the, the leader learning community just a bit. What, what exactly are you, so you're evaluating the past and you're planning the future. Is that essentially kind of what's happening? Yeah. uh, We ask three questions that guide LLC. What is, where they're looking at the current reality. Uh-huh. And we have some tools to help them with that. What could be mm-hmm. asking them to dream about what God could do. Mm-hmm. And then finally, what will be mm-hmm. where they're going to say, okay, here's out of all the possible things we could do. Here's what we're going to do. And then um, closing out in a worship celebration time. And then we try to do some sort of community building things as a part of that. COVID's messed that up a little bit for us, but we're like everybody hopeful for the fall. Yeah. Wow. So like out of that leader learning community, you know, because of the fostering of the huddles, the missional community and that leader learning community, it's like they're learning to dream and kind of catch this vision for disciple making and multiplication. And it's just kind of this natural, it's cool to watch because it's like the natural byproduct of disciple making is multiplication and you don't have to overtly say it. It just, it just happens. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, that started that started with huddle mm-hmm. where we're, we're telling students in the very beginning, hey, I'm going to disciple you. And eight months, I want you to be ready to disciple someone else mm-hmm. because that's how the kingdom of God grows. Yep. And so at the personal level, you're setting up for multiplication. 
And so it, that just flows right out to the group, the missional community level. And I'm praying that one day that's going to even flow out to like the ministry and, and church-wide mm-hmm. level to where we're multiplying out college ministry, college-focused mm-hmm. churches at some point in Man. the future. I could definitely, yeah, I remember Scott used to always, you know, say that to us. I forgot the exact wording of it, but, you know, if you, you know, if you make disciples, you'll, in, in, in turn, you'll end up getting new churches. Um, yeah. When you do that. Well, that's really cool, Drew. And I think something I forgot to ask, but when you're, when you're trying to identify those folks to be in a huddle, what are, what are you kind of looking for there? Is that open to everybody or how's that look? Yeah. To be, to like, so folks, we would want to huddle. Mm-hmm. I tell my students a couple things. So number one, look for people who really want it. If you're trying to force someone, <laughs> they're probably going to drop a couple of weeks yeah. in. Right. So to, to look for people who say that is something I to be discipled, it's something I want. Mm-hmm. And in the past, I've said you need to huddle people who are committed to being a part of Morrison Heights. Mm-hmm. But we're kind of getting to a place where I'm stepping back from that a little bit and just, hey, the people the Lord put in your life, disciple. Them. So I, I tell my students, give a high bar, high challenge invitation. Give it to several people knowing that not everyone's going to say yes, and that's okay. And the ones who do say yes, go with them. So, yeah, we do we do a pretty high – set a pretty high bar for huddle mm-hmm. because I would rather set a high bar and have people tell me no mm. before they join my huddle rather yep. than a month in. Yeah, yeah, because um, you end up getting frustrated. Yep. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we have two levels of huddle. We huddle our huddle leaders. Mm-hmm as they're then huddling uh, that sort of third tier of disciples. Gotcha. And then we have a few things we look for to determine whether or not someone's ready to lead a huddle on top of that. Gotcha. Well, man, what do you think as you have, you know, is, is this is kind of, you know, this leadership huddles, missional community, leader learning communities, what have been, what have you seen? What, how has this really impacted your ministry could you kind of give us a synopsis of that? I know you've shared a little bit around it, but any thoughts you'd, you'd want to give there? Yeah, the switch from, I, I would say, a top-down structure of ministry where it's like me as the minister trying to oversee and have my hand in everything to a transition where it's really bottom-up. It's students leading everything, and I'm just empowering them. Mm-hmm. That has given me more joy and freedom in my ministry Mm -hmm. than I think anything else I could have done. Four years ago, I I would have been looking out at our college midweek gathering and felt a burden that, you know, we've got at that time, we had 65 students in the room and I really only knew where 12 of them were spiritually. Mm -hmm. That really burdened. And there was so much pressure on me to try to be that person for all 65 in the room Mm -hmm. versus now when we have a college gathering, I can look out and for about 80% of the students, I know, I may not know them well personally, but I know who does. Gotcha. Uh, And I know who's discipling. And man, that's just given me so much more freedom. Like when I preach the word, I'm like, okay, I may not say this exactly right, but I know like, like Dylan or Samantha are going to be in these people's lives and they're going to help them get it and put it into practice it's just given me a tremendous amount of freedom as i lead our ministry man and and to know that like we're developing leaders that lord willing we're going to send all over the world and they're going to have an impact it's been very free yeah you know i i didn't set out to do this with the goal of seeing an increase of numbers in our ministry we just initially added in huddles we didn't really change anything else we added in huddles and that alone changed the feel of our, our college gathering times. Really? You, could, you could sense a spiritual vitality in our worship gatherings mm. that was different. Oh, so you, you guys also do a midweek worship gathering too, huh? We do. Okay. Yeah, we do. We do a college midweek gathering. We've done it weekly right now. We got a, a little bit of a funky schedule, but yeah, we're, we're doing all of it. And having huddle, having missional community, people feel like this is their church family. Mm-hmm. And so we, we don't feel like we're asking too much of them to do all that, at least not at this point. Yeah. Well, man, Drew, that, that is, um, that's really good. Do you, do you happen to have, um, maybe just a couple of, man, maybe stories, testimonies of like students and just 
how all of this has really created fruit in your ministry? Is there anything you can think of? <laughs> yeah, you know, I love, um, we're on our uh, fourth generation of huddles. Wow. And I can think about that, that first group that jumped in. Uh, and I got two students in particular, Kalasha and Dylan. Kalasha's out of college, Dylan's a senior. And I can look and see four generations in both of them four generations of disciple where they're freshmen who are being discipled as a result of Dylan and Kalisha's line. But also right. they've continued to disciple more every year. Yeah. And just thinking about Dylan who came in as a freshman, he was one of our first huddle leaders his sophomore year and seeing how he's grown as a leader. And now he's in the fall planning to move to new Orleans and be a part of a church plant. That's, trying to do a house church model of church to reach the city of New Orleans, the hard places in New Orleans. Wow. And like, I didn't call him to that. The Lord called him to that. Yeah. And that's the stuff that gets me excited about doing what we do here in um, little old Clinton, Mississippi. Yeah. Well, I love that, man. Well, that's great stuff, Drew. And man, I, you know, it's been a real joy just to get to kind of walk with you through all that from our time with, uh, with Scott to see what God has done through that. And, you know, and just the releasing students. God has gifted every student. He's put his Holy Spirit in every student who's trusted in him as Lord. And, and you know, in fact, if we could just invest in them the most important things and release them to be disciples, it's pretty awesome to see what happens and to see Absolutely. how they live in the ministry. That's really good. Well, Drew, how if uh, folks want to connect with you, what's probably the best way to do that? Yeah, you can add me on Facebook uh, and shoot me a message. Mm-hmm. You can look up our church, Morrison Heights Baptist Church. You can find my email address on there. Mm-hmm. My church email address is ddabs at morrisonheights.org. You can also reach me at drew.dabs at gmail.com. That's dabs, D-A-B-B-S, yeah. two Bs. Got to get that. Awesome. Um, well, Drew, thanks so much for being on, man. This was uh, really great, really helpful, just talking nuts and bolts of, of the ministry and about releasing students. So, man, I appreciate you taking the time to jump on with us. Anytime, man. I enjoyed getting to share. All right, man. We'll talk to you later. See you, Drew. See you, Mitch. Well, friends, thanks for joining us on the Roundup Podcast. A great interview with Drew. Please reach out to him if you have any questions. I know he'd love to hear from you and would love to help you. Don't forget, Roundup is happening May 12th to the 14th. you got a couple of days left to register. It is free. All you have to do is get there. It's at sbtexas.com slash roundup. And then follow us on social media at SBTC Collegiate. That's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we have a Facebook group, Roundup Network. You can jump in there, ask questions, ideas, share. It's got the gamut. You need to join that network of other college leaders from around Texas and also the nation. And please like and subscribe and even review this podcast. We'd love to gain more listeners who want to know how it's being a benefit to you or not being a benefit to you. That would actually be super helpful. So thanks for joining us today, and we will see you next time.